in the name of Jesus drought in your life that even when it is physical rainy season it is still dry season spiritually financially and otherwise I decree and declare let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall you welcome to another spirit filled message on christocentric message if you're new to this channel i would entreat you to hit on that subscribe button and then to like this video as well i would want you to share this message across because we believe that as this message is coming forth it's going to bless you your graces are going to be imparted onto you and then god is going to visit your home thank you for watching stay blessed so we need to examine through the lens of scripture what kind of a believer is God looking for? What kind of a man of God is God looking for? What kind of a vessel is God looking for? If it is true that God has standards and his standards are unbending, his standards are uncompromising, then it is important for us to not just be aware that God wants to move across the nations, and not just be aware that we can make ourselves available but we need to know God's standards so that we obtain grace to rise to that level that can make us great and prepared vessels when it has to do with the program of God God is not ashamed to declare his need for man as mighty and as great as God is he has been very vocal and outspoken as to the fact that when it has to do with the advancement of his purposes on earth, he needs the cooperation and the partnership of man. From the moment he made that divine declaration in Genesis 1, 26 down to 28, the Bible says, and Elohim said, let us make man in our own image and after our likeness he says and let them have dominion the moment that utterance came out from the lips of god it became scripturally incorrect for god to do anything on earth and leave man out of the program not because he does not have the sovereign power the earth still remains the lord but from that statement he has come into an eternal partnership with man as far as his dealings on earth is concerned there will always be a need for a man it's important for us to appreciate this as an introduction this morning sometimes you see the bible express god as though he were helpless and you are tempted to ask god you are so mighty what is it about man that makes you so can't you push him out of the way and do everything yourself this was a contemplation of the psalmist hallelujah that should be psalm 8 the psalmist began to vocalize his contemplations and he says when i consider the works of your hands this and that and that all that you have created what is man that thou art mindful of him nor the son of man he says that thou visitest him he says you have made him a little lower than the angels the word there is elohim a little lower than god you have crowned him with glory and virtue and paul quoting that scripture in hebrews chapter 2 added a greater context to it you have set him above the works of your hands you have made him the zenith of your creation and that in doing so you left nothing that was not under his feet he says but we do not yet see all things under his feet so let us have it as a very clear understanding that for as long as the program of God in this side of his kingdom is concerned God will always need men you would hear expressions in scripture I sought for a man as a case study let's go to Isaiah chapter 6 the Bible begins the book of Isaiah with a very interesting rendition prophet Isaiah begins that book by giving several profound prophecies but when we get to chapter 6 and verse 1, 6 and verse 1, the Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, 
high and lifted up and his train filled the temple verse 2 and it stood above it stood the seraphims each one had six wings with twain they covered his face with twain he covered his feet and with twain he did fly verse 3 and one cried unto another saying holy 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 is the lord god of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory verse 4 and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke now when isaiah saw this he was watching this in a vision he said woe is me for i am undone because i am a man of unclean lips and i dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for mine eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts verse 6 then flew one of the seraphims unto me having a live coal in his hands which he had taken with the tongues from the altar and he laid it upon my mouth and said lo this had touched thy lips and thine iniquity is taken away and thy sin purged and also i heard a voice of the lord saying verse 8 is my verse of emphasis whom shall i send and who will go for us whom shall i send and who will go for us this is a divine call from god himself look at the kind of glory and splendor that was described from verse 1 down to verse 5 how can such a great god look at the beauty of the seraphims themselves covered with six wings with two they covered their faces with two they covered their feet and with two they flew should such a god be in need of anybody isaiah said the whole earth is filled with his glory and that even his vision the smoke of his presence filled everywhere and instead of god making a declaration to say isaiah let it be known to you that i am god all by myself i can do anything i want to do i am alpha omega you would think that is the kind of sound that should come from such splendor and yet in the midst of that splendor the sound that comes out is who shall go for us who shall i send and who shall go for us and isaiah said here am i send me many believers wonder why in every generation it looks as if god just isolates a few people particularly as touching the fivefold ministry and then they receive such a mighty investment of his grace and power upon their lives doing great and mighty things for god throughout their generation while it looks like there is a crowd of others just crouching to find relevance as far as spiritual things are concerned this troubled me for many years as to why a god that is so benevolent and lavish would seem to be so meticulous about the use of men until i found out that it took more than availability to be used by god so let's join you a bit to see a few of the factors that determine god's using a man because i can tell you in the southeast god is still looking for men in this nation god is still looking for men in the world today God is still looking for men we examined yesterday that Jesus himself said truly the harvest is wide but the laborers are few and he left us with a recommendation he said pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he will recruit more laborers hallelujah and God's recruitment system is about the strictest I am aware of in our world today there are many corporations that sometimes they call to receive um, new employees new staff structure and sometimes you see the burdensome requirements that they put you must have this number of years of experience you must have this range of qualifications and even at that it does not guarantee by itself that you will get the job 
and you can find out for a job with a vacancy of 10 or 15 spaces you can find as much as 15,000 graduates apply am I right on that and people invent all kinds of skills some use their uncles who are working there other people go to church for prayer other people consult shrines and everybody invents his skill to ensure that he gets into that place and at the end of it it looks like there are a few people who seem to secure that spot and if you go and ask the HR department they will tell you that they are a kind they may all be graduates they may be all certified but there are certain people that the corporation is looking for and the reason why those corporations have the standards that are desired is because they do not compromise on their standards God loves everybody but it's important for us to know that he's passionate about the fruition of his program and that passion it is what has driven his strictness in the kinds of vessels that he uses and that he will use there are three requirements that the Bible reveals as to the kind of man God uses the kind of vessel that God desires to use and I want you to please lend me your attention scripture starts by saying Apostle Peter teaching us nevertheless the foundation of the Lord standard sure it says having this seal that the Lord knoweth them that are his then he says and let every man that name the name of Christ depart from iniquity then he says but in a great house that there are four kinds of vessels in every great house number one vessels of gold number two vessels of silver number three vessels of wood number four vessels of clay and the Bible says already by that description some vessels are ordained unto honor and some vessels are unto dishonor but that you can transit this is the good news that should be first um, Peter I thought he was looking for it. okay second Timothy now two and let's do 20 and 21 second Timothy 2 21 that was Paul mentoring his son Timothy but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver but also of wood and of earth and it says some vessels are unto honor and some dishonor now watch 21 carefully apostle paul is teaching us in this scripture that a possibility exists that you can evolve yourself from any level and any kind of vessel you are into the highest quality of vessels now scientifically clay cannot become silver clay cannot become gold wood cannot become gold but here is paul teaching us that in the spirit transiting in quality as a vessel is possible that i can start as a vessel of wood and a vessel of clay do you know the difference the difference in the quality of these vessels are only revealed in the presence of fire you never know how qualitative they are until you expose them to fire when you expose wood to fire it it, it just completely burns off when you expose clay to fire it breaks but when you expose silver and gold it becomes malleable enough to be molded into any shape you desire but there is no disintegration are we together yeah. so he's saying that these four kinds of because of the fierceness of the assignment that the vessels will be involved in he's saying there are some vessels because they have chosen to remain in that state their destiny will be dishonor eventually they will not last not because it is the will of God to keep them that way. The quality of the vessel they have assumed does not have longevity in view. Are we together? So he's now saying there is a condition upon which a man can evolve to become a more superior vessel. 
and the key is found in verse 21 if a man therefore purge himself from these he says he shall be a vessel unto honor that means becoming a vessel unto honor is not just the will of God per se it is totally the responsibility of the individual vessel he says he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and meet for the master's use and then prepared unto every good work may we be such vessels in the name of Jesus Christ I have studied great people who have been used by God in modern history and from scripture all in a bid to piece together the ingredients that truly makes a man usable by God I wanted that first for my life and then to be able to extend that information to be a blessing to as many who sincerely desire to be used by God I studied materials of men like T.L. Osborne materials of men like Lester Sumrall great prophets who had gone to be with the Lord consulted materials of our fathers of faith what exactly did God find in this man that made them greatly used by God and I came up with three keys and this is what I want to share this morning number one the first requirement non-negotiable demand that God must find in an individual to be greatly used by him is called the purity of your heart please write it down the purity of your heart in order of priority I have worked with God a bit I tell you with all humility and I can tell you that this I have learned about God the greatest posture that a man can take to secure the attention of God over your life is the state of your heart the state of your heart vetoes your prayer life the state of your heart vetoes your fasting the state of your heart vetoes your Bible study there is no other Christian experience that is exalted higher than the state of your heart every other thing in your life as a Christian activity only finds its relevance with respect to the state of your heart please understand this our world today is full of very sincere spiritual activities from fastings to prayer to word study to all kinds of spiritual activities and many people find out that the more they engage in these activities it looks like these activities carry a semblance of it, it, it's it captures within it the ability to bring them closer to God but in practicing these things they still find out that what they are looking for is truly not found because it is not found in activities is found in a state there must be a posture that any believer who desires to be used by God if you want to be used by God as a vessel I tell you the truth no matter what else you bring to the table if it is outside of the purity of the state of your heart God cannot do much with you do you know the reason why David earned a status in the Bible called a man after God's heart I don't know how many times David had direct encounters with God but there are people in scripture who had greater encounters than David an example Moses Moses was called the meekest man but never called a man after God's heart look at the laborious assignment that was given to Moses to take God's covenant people from Egypt the land of captivity and to take them to Canaan a land flowing with milk and honey God called him the meekest man and yet he never had that report that he was a man after God's heart how about other prophets who had great encounters with God not even Samuel the mighty prophet was called a man after God's heart if you want to know the life of David and why God called him a man after his heart you go and study the entire life of David 
at the end of it you will almost be confused as to why such a man as to why such a man should be called maybe you may need to put your phones on silent please a man after God's heart how does he call a man like David a man after God's heart read your Bible and see some of the atrocities that David committed read your Bible and see some of the things that David went through the reason for Uriah's death the reason for many other things that happened and yet among the many things that God could accord this man was the status of a man after my heart there are many names that God gives men God is not careless in naming men certain things he called Abraham my friend you know what it means to be a friend of God we are not discussing that but do not downplay that status if a man is called a friend of God it is a very serious commendation there are some things that will not happen to you again when you become a friend of God for instance you cannot be lost again it is a privilege for you to be lost God will take you even if it's an untimely death but you will not be lost again it is a status and an honor when a man is called a friend of God hmm. hallelujah the second thing that you earn as the friend of God is that there is nothing he does within his program that he will keep you outside of that information that's what happened to Abraham shall I hide this from Abraham he had to come and tell Abraham this is what I want to do to Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham says stop I have an interest there do not go yet there is somebody's interest that I need to protect and he literally negotiated the salvation of Lot and his family the friend of God so you now understand what he meant when he told the apostles he said I no longer call you servants but friends they didn't even know what he was saying that is the reason why even in heaven the foundation of the new Jerusalem has their name the names of the 12 apostles can you imagine that let's get back to what we're discussing the purity of your heart let me show you a scripture second chronicles 25 1 and 2 second chronicles 25 1 and 2 a very interesting story about a king called Amaziah we're going to read verse 1 and 2 together Are we ready one to read please Amaziah was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem and his mother's name was Jehoiada of Jerusalem now read verse 2 as loud as you can one to read and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord but not with a perfect heart one more time what kind of a statement is this how can you do what was right in the sight of the Lord and then the Lord says even though this was right there is still a problem with it the problem was not the correctness of the activity the problem was the state of the heart that executed it that a man can preach correctly and yet be found wanting in the spirit a man can do evangelism correctly and still be found wanting in the spirit you can build ministry correctly and still be found wanting the Bible says give us that scripture <laughs> he did what was right in the sight of the Lord but there was a, tr a problem he was not a fake man of God he was not a fake prophet he was not a fake apostle he was not a fake preacher genuine you would come and see him preach and you would be so convicted by his message and yet in marking his script the Lord gives us the marking standard that beyond the correctness of a man's activity the first thing that is marked in the spirit 
is the state of your heart never forget this scripture for the rest of your life you can fast right you can pray right you can give right you can preach right you can do business right and be surprised that in spite of the correctness of your activity heaven still finds you wanting Amaziah he served he did what was right in the sight of the Lord but not with a perfect heart The purity of a man's heart is the principal determinant of your doing business with God, of your being used by God, mightily used by God. Beyond your activities, God looks at the state of your heart. Every man you see that God has used and is using greatly, I can tell you whether you believe it or not, there is something God has found about the sincerity of their heart. No wonder in choosing vessels, by the time you see God's selection, you will be angry. Because when God is done choosing the kinds of people, they do not match what you would have wanted. It does not make sense. Are we together now? Do you know the reason why Jonah ran away from the instruction God gave him? There was something about God Jonah knew that out of these depraved people who were idol worshippers, who were insincere people, that if you went and he preached to them, that as bad as they were, their hearts were still pure. Because their activity was a product of their orientation and they had not been given a chance yet to declare whether they loved God or not. And so God seemed to have an interest in a terrible nation called Nineveh and Jonah knew this that God will look beyond the wrongness of their activity that in spite of the fact that that land was in decadence the purity of their heart was crying for help and he said Jonah go to them and Jonah said I know something about God by the time I now preach these people will repent and he will forgive them as if he did not see anything they did and Jonah ran away immediately Jonah ran away he became an enemy of God there's no time I would have taught you what it means to be an enemy of God to be an enemy of God does not mean to be satanic the moment you become an a consistent interruption to his program even if he's the one who ordained you you become an enemy of God so when you are praying the prayer let God arise and all his enemies verify first that you are not one of them did you hear what I said Jonah was not a fake prophet but because he became an interruption to God's program in Nineveh look at how merciless his judgment came people received prophet Jonah into their boat and started going down they lost their businesses they lost their relevance they were about to lose their lives how can a mighty prophet be the reason for the downfall of many if you know God, you will know that it's not about being fake or real. It's about being in his program or outside of his program. Hmm. So in the moment you say, I am a genuine man of God, to mean because I am a genuine man of God, God's program must be advanced through my life. You are in error. There are many genuine people who are interruptions to God's program. Are you learning now? Yes. How can Jonah, a, the Bible never charged Jonah with falsehood. The Bible never charged Jonah with idolatry. And yet, because he refused to go and preach to Nineveh, a land that he was justifiably angry. These were a people rating by their activities. They were wicked people, yet their hearts were pure. You now see why Jesus taught in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in there is a reward for them he says they shall see God that the purity in heart is a requirement for encounters my God that means someone can be smoking and can be drinking and God is looking beyond that wickedness and he's looking at the state of his heart and the language of his heart is saying I need a savior and 
Jesus Christ will come and appear to that gentleman under a bridge and say, I have come to visit you. And you are wondering why another person is fasting three days dry and may never have an encounter. The, I hope you know that the heart of men has a voice. Say not in your heart. A man's heart can have a voice. Beyond the activities of men, God listens to the heart of man. I can pretend here and be doing a lot of religiosity and saying, oh, Apostle Joshua Selman, this is a humble man of God and then heaven is watching while all that religious drama is happening just to make a name. Heaven and is hearing the voice of pride, the voice of unseriousness. Are we learning now? No wonder in selecting the one who would be the king, David. I hope you know David's being a man after God's heart did not just happen when he was king. It was why he was called in the first place. That gentleman was in the wilderness where nobody saw him, nobody could clap for him, and yet he defended his father's sheep. Even at the expense of his life with nobody to see and he did not come back and tell his father This is what happened When it was time to anoint Even the great Samuel with his height of discernment was about to make a mistake and God said hold on This is not how I judge if you were to judge Eliab and all his brothers You would see them as people of stature and intelligence are we together now and yet that was not how God judged them so a correct prophet with the ability to hear God says no to God's program and becomes God's enemy immediately he goes to board a ship going at the other side and because of that all the passengers in his ship started losing things there was a storm now do you know that the anointing was not designed to fight god the anointing only fights what is antichrist that means if god is the factor and the resistance behind your life no amount of prayer except the prayer of mercy will save you there are many people trying to use the anointing to stop things that is the very resistance of God that is bringing it. You see our ignorance, we think the anointing is just a multi-purpose instrument that fights anything, even God. No. The anointing has a protocol for its function. It must verify that what is the cause of that problem is antichrist. Then it can fight it and bring it to order. Because the assignment of the anointing is to bring all things into the will of God. That is a singular assignment of the anointing. Before the anointing works, it verifies the will of God with respect to that situation. So if an individual is sick, the anointing diagnoses that state with respect to the will of God and knows that this is not the will of God. Now it can flow freely because its assignment now becomes to bring confirmation to the word. Outside of the will of God, the anointing has no assignment except to confirm and to bring compliancy to the will of God. Are we learning this morning? So we're examining the factors that will cause a vessel to be used by God. And number one, we're saying the purity of your heart. And we consider the scripture. Let's look at it one more time. I don't want you to forget that scripture. Not Jonah, my dear media man. Second Chronicles 25 and verse 2. Let's read it again. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. He preached correctly. From a doctrinal standpoint, there was no error in what he said. Yet it did not produce the effect you thought it would produce. You wrote the book correctly, theologically accurate. Yet the impact that should come from it did not come. You sang correctly when you came on stage. Nothing wrong with the revelation of your song. But while you were singing, people were just watching you as if you were reciting a poem to yourself. The power that should accompany the correctness of that activity did not follow it. There's something wrong with the heart. When everything is right 
and the result still does not come the problem is not the activity the problem is the heart let me repeat myself when everything is right your tithing is right your giving is right your everything is right and yet the result that should follow does not follow forget about the activity and go back to re-examine the state of your heart when your preaching is right theologically constructed right with power and passion yet the transformation that should follow your teaching does not follow leave the issue of the sermon and go back to examine the state of your heart many people would have experienced deliverance faster if they understood that most of the things we think are the problems in our lives and our ministries are truly not the problem it's not the problem of the elders even though it looks like eldership is the problem in the church it's not the problem of money even though it looks like money is the real problem it's not the problem of witches and wizards coming to your church to masquerade as choir members or masquerade as protocol members that, that is not the issue in the, you notice that in diagnosing problems we diagnose every other thing but the heart why is this church not growing for instance I think it's because we're at a, a wrong location no I think it's because maybe my sermons are not correct maybe they are too short maybe they are too long maybe to, to alter and we invent all kinds of skills that touch every other activity but the real problem the state of the heart the state of the heart I have had people come to meet me and say apostle i'm tired of this thing i don't know what god wants again i fasted till i'm almost feeling sick no power no revelation in the midst of the fasting and prayer i still had the dream i was trying to avoid again those spirits came as if they are not aware that i'm praying in a prayer program after three hours of praying i just wanted to take a short nap and at just that five minutes i was still in my village again what kind of what kind of 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 discouragement is this the problem is not the activity correcting the activity without correcting your heart will only recycle your frustration let me say it again correcting the activity without correcting your heart And I hope you know that the Lord has a lot of things to say about the heart of man. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. Please give it to us. Let's see God's own diagnosis about and concerning the heart of man. The Bible says the heart is deceitful. That means the heart is so deceitful it can deceive even its owner. You who is the owner of the heart can be deceived by your own heart. The heart of man is deceitful above all things. He said, and desperately wicked who can know it. Verse 10. Watch how God rewards. Let's read. One to read, please. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. That means in rewarding men, in opening doors in allocating graces i look beyond just the zeal there is something about the heart of man that i search for the first requirement to be a vessel unto honor to transit from a vessel of wood and clay to a vessel of silver and gold to be like that man that the lord is seeking for to change nations, to change the climate of Enugu, the southeast, to be lifted as a vessel right from this place to the ends of the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, let's forget about the issue of church for one minute. Let's forget about the issue of apostle and prophet for one minute. Let's forget about the issue of intelligent ministrations for one minute. And let's allow the Lord, that great physician, to perform a surgery in our hearts one of the worst medical cases an individual can have is cardiac arrest or anything that has to do with your heart are we together medical science would tell us that the major reason why people lose their lives is that eventually their hearts fail there are organs that fail in your body and you can still the ball can still 
be running but not when your heart fails leave every other thing in your body right but let your heart fail and you will die in an instant with a correct brain you will still die with feet that is healthy you will still die with a body that you have labored taking it to the gym you will still die but there are people whose feet have been amputated and yet they are alive there are people who have lost fingers there are people who have lost their sense of smell lost their sense of hearing lost their sense of sight there are even cases of people who have dementia there are people who have had brain damage and regardless what happens to them the deterioration provided their hearts are still pumping there is still hope for them when you borrow that that means your church building can still be working properly the chairs can still be working well the television station still working well you're speaking as a man of God still well intelligence still there but the moment your heart is wrong there is a spiritual cardiac arrest and you will not understand the reason why in spite of partners in spite of branches in spite of everything there is no motion there is no progress I am telling you that the number one key in being used by God is your heart condition you are the first you are the stream you are the hunger living deep inside of me you are the food that satisfies you are provision for the journey of my life are everything when you get to a point in your life where your love for Jesus becomes greater than your love for fame your love for Jesus becomes greater than your passion for anointing your love for Jesus becomes greater than your desire to be a celebrity your love for Jesus becomes greater than your ability or your desire to have ministrations to be a great person then you have gotten to that realm that rare realm in the spirit where only few men ever get to now let me tell you this nobody has the power to make his heart pure you only have the power to allow God make it pure did you hear what I said it is not within your power to make your heart pure the journey of the purification of a man's heart is equal to the journey to death. Nobody, no matter how sincere, it is not given to you to make your heart pure by yourself. You can only give God allowance and say, Father, I don't know how far this journey is going to take me, but let's begin that journey. And when you start that journey, step by step, He will begin to lead you through several processes let me tell you how God purifies the hearts of men what I'm about to tell you may disturb some of you but that is the truth there are three strategies in the Bible that God uses to purify the hearts of men number one is called the furnace of affliction that's why I said it would disturb many of you <laughs> ah. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you face diverse temptations. He says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And that if you allow patience, verse 4, now James 1, let patience have her perfect work. What will it make you? That ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. There is something called the furnace of affliction. And the goal is not to destroy you. When you read Isaiah 43 verse 1 and 2, it says, Fear not, I have redeemed you, O Israel. Think someone to become a kingdom financier and gives him an instruction. Give away your car. 
give away your house empty your account and you say no this is god this is unfair how can this brother somebody that gave me a lift last week is trekking today and god says leave me i know what i'm doing because the kind of wealth i want to trust to this man can kill him if that circumcision does not happen and so god says leave him and you now get up and say no i make up my mind my friend i decided to rent a house for you move in there you become an interruption I have taught you that you don't have to be fake to be an enemy of God. The moment you are a consistent interrupter of his program, you become his enemy, even if you are Jonah. In the kingdom, it's not always about fake and real. It's about the will of God or otherwise. When the captain of the Lord's army appeared to Joshua, Joshua asked him a very interesting question. He said, are you for us? Or against us what was the answer he said neither in other words that's not how God works when he comes he does not take side his will is always his side so an unbeliever can be in the will of God and while you are praying for God to destroy him God will leave him there even if he's a politician because he has found out that he's been in his will will achieve his purposes much more because that is how God raised Cyrus is this is a mystery about God so you can see a CEO who may not be a Christian and you will be praying and say, God, get this guy out of the way and let a tongue-talking person sit there. And God examines your prayer in light of his will and finds out that based on the conclusion that his will has provided, this vessel is the most appropriate for now because all the other vessels will not birth his will. No matter how you pray, God will not take that man out of that place. Listen, this is why your prayer does not carry much if it is outside the will of God. And this is the confidence that we have. Is that in your Bible? That when we ask anything, not according to our desire, according to his will, there is a guarantee that he heareth us. Most people do not know how determined God is to see his will come to pass. Read your Bible and see how God punished even the people he loved because they became an interruption to his will. Who would know that God would be the reason for the captivity of Israel? Yet he was the same. When you study scripture, if you study scripture outside of the will of God, God will look like a confusing person to you. One moment you are bringing deliverance to a people. Next moment you are the one giving access to their enemies to destroy them. What kind of a God are you like that? Because everything in his economy revolves around his will. Hallelujah. So you can find a man as a man of God. You can look at a gentleman in your church. And God will tell you this guy. I have called him to be a great worshiper. But the prophet that God should raise from your church. Is not willing to walk with God and is not willing to be serious. And that vacancy becomes there for a long time. If the worshiper starts aligning himself to the training of a prophet, God can switch his assignment and give him that bishopric. He can start as a worshiper and not know what evolved him into a prophet. Because in God's mind, there is nothing like he must be like this forever. Everything is with respect to his will. And it can change if it interrupts his will. Is someone learning this morning? These are things that we need to understand. The will of God is the focal point in God's dealing with men. More love, more power, more of you in my life. More love, more power more of you in my life ladies and gentlemen when jesus was in gethsemane he prayed a very disturbing prayer he said father if it is possible can you take this cup off me but he remembered that in as much as he was the son of god 
God will give up anything and anyone to preserve his will so he quickly said nevertheless even if it means forgetting about my prayer and not answering it not my will but your Angels are not shown mercy. That's why Jesus did not die for them. You see, there are spirits. I hope you know that Satan is not the only fallen spirit. And Satan in truth is not even the worst of the spirits. Hmm. There are spirits today that are being bound in everlasting chain. Is that in your Bible? Satan is not even one of them. And the Bible says those spirits have been bound for the sake of the elect. I hope you know it was God that designed the lake of fire. Hello? <laughs> the lake of fire is part of God's kingdom. Who designed it? That's where Satan will be thrown into. So who would have designed it? The lake of fire is different from hell, oh. When you read the book of Revelations, hell itself and death will be relocated into the lake of fire. The Bible says that is the second death. So officially, the judgment of sinners has not begun. It will start officially when Satan joins them in that destruction. Are we Bible students? Yeah. The lake of fire is part of God's kingdom. It is a representation of his justice. It is a representation of his holiness. It remains so through eternity. Satan himself will be taken to the lake of fire. Death as a spirit, the fourth man upon the rider upon the horse that Revelation gives. Are we together? The one riding upon the pale horse whose name is death will also be relocated to the lake of fire. Is it not in your Bible? Yes. And all this will be born. Satan has not started his judgment. The Bible says he knows that his time is short. So there is a time allotted for him. It is the reason why you cannot bind all the demon spirits and, and Satan and keep them in one place and stop their motion. You cannot. You can only dispel them within your environment as they interrupt the purposes of God. There is nobody who has the ability to gather all the demons and all the spirits. Not even Jesus did it. When he was going to cast out demons he did not bind them to keep them to say you will never move they are given the liberty of mobility you can only sanitize your environment sanitize your life and your atmosphere with respect to birthing the purposes of god but a time is going to come where there will be a clarion call they will be gathered by themselves that was what was adumbrated in the parable of the wheat and the tears is it not in your bible are we bible students Remember the wheat and the tears? The Bible says, while men slept, an enemy came. Am I right? And he sowed tears among the wheat. And when they came and saw it, they found out that something was wrong. And then the farmer said, okay, let us... He said, no, 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 no. Don't do that like that. In doing that, you will not know which one is the wheat and tear. He said, let them grow. When they grow, there is something only the wheat can carry that the tears will not carry and when it is the time of the harvest you will now gather the wheat and then you will put the tears together and burn them in everlasting fire that's what jesus taught us so you see that there are many things we do as believers that is not from a standpoint of spiritual intelligence you cannot bind the spirits that are around enugu or the east and put them in one place and say in the name of jesus christ from today you don't have access to mobility no every spirit jesus casted out is still in the earth the spirits that oppress men today the bodies that they are oppressing is not the first they have they are used to occupy many many bodies that is why you see satan has an advantage of experience you cannot use experience against him you only use the forces of victory that have been given through Christ. 
in terms of experience they have longevity of stay they have entered and possessed and oppressed and manipulated too many human bodies you are not the first preacher and you are not the first church to receive an onslaught from satan using experience may be a very weak tool to bring in victory to yourself now thanks be to god the bible says which causes us always to triumph hallelujah are we still together we are discussing that which makes a man usable not just available and number one we said the state of your heart ladies and gentlemen let me tell you in your journey in ministry and in your journey in life and destiny you will confront many things that will want to challenge the position of god in your life for instance fame for instance persecution in fact it says what shall separate us from the love of god then it begins to list it there is a concise list i hope you know that both good and bad things can disrupt god's position in your life for instance there are people today who keep saying lord i love you with all my heart until the day somebody gives you a hundred million cash or one billion the appetite for prayer dies as you are receiving that money immediately because you find out that many of your prayer requests was driven by your need for bread and tea and now the passion to pray and to fast is no longer there how about when god announces you as a man of god and everybody already knows you as a man of god what is the need to study again what is the need to pray again what is the need to fast again after all the nations know you you see that there are many people who leave god in the face of plenty there are many people who leave god in the face of glitz and glamour they leave god in the face of when they evolve to versions of the of themselves that the nation celebrate you see many of them will leave the things of god so before you begin the journey with god he probes you and says let me work on you and furnish you to become a vessel unto honor there is a level in life when you grow in terms of increase financial increase or in influence there are certain groups upon the earth that watch the growth of men like a meter when you hit a certain threshold they will come and meet you they will sell you ideas and say join us become part of us and there are privileges you will enjoy if you have not met them they are coming just keep rising i assure you by the god of heaven you know what i'm talking about and you know i'm not lying in every state in every city in every region and in every nation there there are groups of people mandated by the devil whether they know they are used by him or not you keep rising let your company keep rising let your ministry keep rising one day there will be a knock on your door spiritually or physically you will be called into a conversation and they'll say we are proposing to you this now you will understand what the bible means when it says what shall it profit a man when he gains show me the market where you do that kind of business that you gain the whole world and lose your soul if i want to sell my soul now call the name of the shop for me that i will go what shop in enugu receives souls and gives them the world in exchange yet the bible says there is a mysterious marketplace on earth where what you sell is not spare part where what you sell are we together is not clothes the commodity is your very soul and there are men that market is a busy market till tomorrow satan proposed it to jesus he said come the third temptation the first temptation of jesus is the first temptation that every man will go through the temptation of need bread your food turn this stone to bread manipulate ministry to satisfy your hunger manipulate the people that go. it is within your power to turn stones to bread and by the time hunger is there he will not come when you are full he will come when there is crisis in the ministry he will come when you need to send your children to school and says remember you're a prophet can't you just call some numbers and somebody will come and give you money can't you quote can't you prophesy the account number of the person and receive 10 million why struggle and have to go through the cross when you can just bow to me and have the world now can i tell you we're examining the heart condition of man i hope i'm not wasting your time 
you must survive that number one temptation there are men who have fallen like a pack of cards because they could not survive it if you are not hungry your temptation will not be about food to eat satan is not stupid he will come to you do you know a spirit called seducing spirits in the bible the bible says the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith and shall give heed to seducing spirits and the doctrine of demons is that in your bible you know how seduction works seduction has no power over you until it unites with a need there has to be a desire in your heart for seduction to work am i right on that if you are looking for a political position chances are excellent that the weapon the devil the seducing spirits will operate in your life with respect to that desperate need so for jesus because he was hungry having fasted 40 days and 40 nights the spirits came the devil came himself and said you are hungry jesus don't tell lies i know you are hungry remember you are the way the truth and the life you are hungry turn this stone to bread turn this stone to bread abuse the use of it manipulate that power to grant your selfish and mundane desires and jesus said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of god second temptation that everybody must survive is the temptation of maintaining your spirituality in the face of greatness the bible says he took him to a holy the top of a holy mountain of the temple and told him fall down there that is the temptation of great men the moment you become great and you are spiritually vibrant the next temptation is be careless with your spiritual life fall down after all it is written he will put his angels charge over you an abuse of grace and mercy they will bear thee up on their wings lest you dash your feet against a stone don't pray you are still anointed go for the conference without preparing even while on stage you are full of revelation something must come for you to preach is it not just to preach and collect your money on or radio and go back that is the temptation of great men so the moment you become great know that your spiritual life is the first point of attack not your church your life he took him to a holy city and said fall down throw yourself down after all he will put his angels charge will the angels watch you go down and not protect you is it not written that he shall put his angels charge over you they shall bear thee up on their wings lest you dash your foot against the stone temptation number three that all men must survive the bible says that satan this one eh satan took him to an exceeding high mountain mountains in scripture talks about spheres of influence he took him there and the bible says he showed him all the glories of the world in a moment the kingdoms of the world matthew 4 says and the glory of them question show me where that mountain is today that you stand upon and you can see the glories of all the world and the kingdoms and here's what he proposed to him verse 9 all these things i will give thee if thou will fall down and worship me southeast herein lies the revelation of what satan really wants he's not interested in your church he's not interested in your money he's not even interested in the child he's not interested in your name or your fame it looks like he's attacking all those things and you may be saying why is satan interested in my marriage why is he interested in my children make no mistakes he's not interested in them this is what he's interested in please give us that scripture that you will fall down and worship me everywhere you see the antichrist system there must be expressions of worship remember nebuchadnezzar 90 feet stature of solid gold and he says after you hear the sound of worship everybody bow down hmm. 
that is why the greatest expression of your loyalty for God is not just in your service it's in your worship your worship your worship oh be lifted above all other gods we lay our crown and worship you you be lifted above all other gods we lay our crown and worship you oh glorious god we praise your name we lay our crown and worship many of you have no idea what happens in the kingdom of darkness when the saints worship a picture of the worship in heaven was given to us in revelations that when they said worthy is the lamb that was slain the bible says the elders will cast their crown and everybody bows before one king this is all satan wants transgenerational allegiance that is the reason why courses have been programmed across every family to make sure that there will always be a representation somebody who will represent worship and loyalty and allegiance to satan even to jesus he said bow and worship me it's not that i want to hold man i don't need man for anything i don't need his prosperity for anything ask people who are involved in cultism or involved in witchcraft or all kinds of things the only thing satan wants is anything that commits you and brings you to a point where he becomes god over your life he can give you all the prosperity he can give you whatever it is that is the reason why the moment you want to prosper without your loyalty to him he will fight you tooth and nail you want to make money without me he says i wish above all things that he prosper and be in health but make sure your soul prospers it is that soul part that satan does not want can i tell you i made up my mind i rather fail in ministry than worship the devil i rather fail you don't worship satan by worshiping satan you worship satan by worshiping anything that is not god satan is too smart to tell you worship me he will say worship money worship yourself worship your wife worship your husband worship your church worship your sermons and you do not know it's still idolatry worship your prayer life worship your fasting life even worship your bible study and while you are doing all of that you think i am worshiping god no anything that is not god even if it came from god is an idol so that you don't think i'm talking of going to the shrine to go and bow down satan is not stupid he has understood the world of men so he will tell you worship any other thing including yourself including your wife including your husband including ministry including money including your certificate by any means i allow you to worship any other thing provided it is not the god of heaven and can i tell you day and night there are people bowing down to satan but as they bow down to their certificates they bow down to satan as they bow down to their ministry every sunday there are many idol worshipers who do not know they are idol worshipers they would rather give up jesus than give up church they would rather give up anything <laughs> listen ladies and gentlemen can i tell you if you ever believe you ever believe that on your own without the pruning of the spirit you are worshiping god in spirit and the truth that state itself is proof that you are under attack i remember one time when god began to walk upon my heart i would pray and say lord use me 
and it says to take away these idols from your heart and i'm saying idols me where again i have never bowed down to anything that is not god i came from a lineage of missionaries where is where is an idol coming from then many of us are very quick to select what we think we are free from i'm free from pride i'm free from lust i'm free from all of these things god i'm free enough and he says that deception is bondage itself are we together i hope you are not feeling insulted this is a deliverance service so it's a proper deliverance service are we together oh glorious god we praise your name we lay our crown and worship you my glorious god i praise your name i lay my crown and worship you you be lifted above all other gods i lay my crown and worship you you be lifted above all other gods I lay my crown hear me I'm going to give us the next five minutes there are idols in our lives listen 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 before you start praying I want you to be sincere with the God of heaven when I was preparing this in the morning, just cross-checking my notes, I found myself praying and said, Lord, let me not come here and pretend before your people. So I myself reveal what are the idols. I'm not talking of witchcraft. I know you will never go to a shrine. But let me show you another shrine that is called a piece of paper lying down in your wardrobe. You would rather give up God a thousand times than your PhD. I'm not insulting it. How about your church? There are many of you, if God says, close your church now, you will cost him to his face. Ah, my means of bread, my means of relevance, I won't close it. There are many of us, your idol is your anointing. There are many of us, your idol is your prayer and your fasting. You think because it's a spiritual activity on its own, it cannot be idolized. Satan is a master at using any other thing aside from God an idol is anything you derive your confidence from an idol is anything that qualifies to earn your loyalty including your fasting including your prayer including the abundance of revelation that you have including your intellect my Bible says trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding he says in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path the next verse says verse 7 be not wise in your own understanding he says fear the lord and turn away from evil listen to me there are certain obvious idols like idolatry lust pride these are very obvious ones so when you find out that you are free from them you can flatter yourself to believe you are free i'm free from lust i'm free from pride i'm free from witchcraft i'm not a false prophet i'm not a fake person i love jesus and yet the master is still saying i cannot use you there is something about your heart oh god you are my god and I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God. And I will ever praise you. I will seek you 
in the morning I have learned to walk in your ways for step by step you lead me and I will follow you all of my days I like you to cry before the Lord in one minute before we continue father help my heart everything that has become an idol in my life regardless what it is lord i pray that in this conference let it be dethroned 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 everything I have everything I am pastor pray forget about ministry now prayer warrior intercessor great man great woman of God campus fellowship president group coordinator let's cry before the king we bow down and worship Yahweh we bow down Worship Yahweh 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 I cast my crown before the highest royalty. I am undone before your glorious majesty. I cast my crown before the highest royalty. I am undone before your glorious majesty. You're the King of kings and lords. Of lords. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. Go ahead and pray. You are brooding over every darkness. You are causing light to shine from dark. You are brooding over every darkness. You are causing lights to shine from darkness. The Holy Ghost is brooding over every darkness. You are causing lights to shine from darkness. Hallelujah. Pray in one minute. 
Lord let my life reflect Jesus not self I dethrone every idol idols of competition idols of pride everything that has exalted itself above you let it go down right now I desire increase but not at the expense of your position I desire lifting but not at the expense of your position I desire church growth but not at the expense of your position in Jesus mighty name we have prayed in Jesus mighty name we have prayed hello beloved in Christ we hope this message was a blessing to you I would want you to do something for us if you are new here kindly hit on that subscribe button for us and then like this video as well share to your family and friends to bless them because we know that this message will be a blessing to spirit we would need you to do one thing for us to tell us in the comment section where you were watching us from and if you've got any testimony for us kindly share with us thank you for watching in the name of Jesus drought in your life that even when it is physical rainy season it is still dry season spiritually financially and otherwise I decree and declare let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall. Let the rain 